Hi ladies, my name is Kathy Clark. I'm Director of Women's Ministries here at Grace Chapel, and we are meeting again in person for Women's Bible Study, Women of the Word. We meet on Wednesdays, 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. And we would love for you to join us. If you can't do that, then we want to make the teachings available to you. We are going through the little book of Habakkuk from the Old Testament. It is a small but mighty book. And we have prepared lessons for this study that can be found on our website, gclancaster.com slash women. You will find the Habakkuk study guide and it will be something for you that you will take you into the Word of God every day and you can follow along with us. A lot to me, but there's also a song very, it, it feels simple, but how great is our God? Um, Chris Tomlin. That one is also, I think, could be a little bit of a theme song for, for this, um, this passage. So open your Bibles with me. We're in the Minor Prophet book of Habakkuk. Um, you can also, you know, turn to the pages. Actually, that might be easier if you just turn to the Habakkuk pages in the back um, where you can see it and write things down. I'm really excited um, now to get into our study with you. <laughs> I wasn't so much last week, um, but anyway, let's pray. Lord, speak to us today through your word. We need an attitude of humility to learn from you, and we need your understanding to grasp what you teach us. <sighs> In your precious name, amen. So let's review a bit. Um, I think chapter three might make more sense if we take a few minutes to review what we've covered so far. So um, as you look in your Bible or at your Habakkuk pages in your study, um, it, it'll help you. I heard a quote this last weekend that I loved. It says, an unopened Bible will remain an unknown Bible. Don't you love that you're beginning to know this book of Habakkuk? I mean, we're, we're almost finished. Next week will be the last passage, and then we have a review week. But um, Granny Jo wrote in our study, and we read it every week, God brought you to Habakkuk for such a time as this. And every time I read that, I thank the Lord that he did, because it has really been a, for such a time as this. For me, how many of you feel the same way? It's like God brought me here, yes. So at the beginning of Habakkuk, we learned that Habakkuk was a lot like us. He wrestled with his questions about the evil and injustice and wickedness he saw among God's people in Judah. And he wanted God to act to bring the people back to obedience. And instead of whining, he took his questions to God. O oh, long, O oh Lord, how long, how long, O oh Lord, is it going to take for you to do something? Remember that? How long, O oh Lord? It's, it's okay to ask questions, to struggle with the injustice of this life. We will never have all the answers. Charles Swindoll said that one principle to draw from the book of Habakkuk is God can handle all our questions, but he answers only a few. We need to remember that. He can handle them all. Then God did answer Habakkuk and told him what he was going to do. God was going to bring a nation that was notorious for its wickedness and cruelty to march through Judah and destroy it. God said he would use the Chaldeans to bring judgment to his people. Habakkuk was shocked, confused, terrified. What? This was not just correction. This was harsh judgment. How can a pure and holy God who can't stand the sight of evil actually use a nation that was even more wicked than Judah to deal with Judah's sins? I love this quote Pastor Chris gave us in lesson four. In a sea of confusion, Habakkuk clung to the life buoy of God's holy character. It was on his outline. He focused on the known instead of the unknown. He knew God's character. He said, I don't understand what you're doing, but I know you. Habakkuk was beginning to shift his focus from comparing, and that's what he was doing. He was comparing wicked Judah to even more wicked Babylon. 
and he changed it from that to the Lord and who he was. Habakkuk was saying, I know your character, so I'll look to you for perspective. Chapter 2, verse 1 in the New Living Translation says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. It's an interesting way to put it. And that was where we left Habakkuk until today's chapter 3. He waited and God answered, telling him to write down his words. It was meant to be read for future generations, even for us. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled, God said, and it may take time, so wait. God says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by his faith. If you remember nothing else from this study, that's what you need to remember but the righteous will live by his faith. Debbie Wilkes taught us that this means to trust God, to wait on him, to rely on him, to be faithful to him. We will begin to see Habakkuk's response to that today. God assured Habakkuk that although the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they're the same, were his instrument to bring judgment to unrepentant Judah, they wouldn't get a pass on their wickedness forever. Their judgment was coming. Woe to you. Or as one paraphrased version says, shame on you. You can think of it as the opposite of the blessed are you in Habakkuk, I mean in Matthew, in the Beatitudes. Debbie Lewis and Granny Joe taught us so much as they took us through the five woes of the Chaldeans. Do you remember any of those five woes? The first one, I'll give you the first one. It was greed. Any others? Injustice. Injustice. Violence. Violence. Drunkenness, yes. Seduction. Seduction, yes. And idolatry, yes. This wicked nation would eventually be taken captive, plundered, shamed, and their wealth would be turned to ashes. In 2.14, God had given a promise of hope when he said there would come a day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In the meantime, Habakkuk was going to need to live not by what he could see with his eyes in his day, but by placing all of his confidence in what God had said about a day to come in the future, a day when all will be made right. It's hard to see beyond our present reality, isn't it? especially if it's a painful one. It's hard to see beyond. But the righteous shall live by faith. I love this quote from Nancy Guthrie. Just as Habakkuk had to think through this, you and I have to think through what it is going to mean for us to live by faith in what God has said rather than by what we can see in our circumstances. And then in Habakkuk 2.20, the Lord punctuates all he has said with this powerful end. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence. And Granny Job taught that last week, and then we sang, Behold our God. The whole earth is stunned in silence at God's sovereign plan over the universe to accomplish justice in his way, in his timing, through the means which he chooses. Now turn to Habakkuk 3 with me. So what did Habakkuk do after he thought it through? He sang. Do you remember at the opening of chapter 2, Habakkuk had positioned himself to await the Lord's reply and to determine how he might respond concerning his complaint? Well, his silence gives way to song. So Habakkuk's prayer, let's look at verse 1 and then look at the very end of verse 19. One says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigianoth, to the choir master with stringed instruments. Habakkuk took time to comp compose a beautiful prayer, a worship song to respond to the Lord. But it wasn't a private prayer. Like a psalm, it was written down so that the people in Habakkuk's day, the people facing devastation to come, and the people like you and me in our day could sing it too. According to Shigianoth, 
what does that sound like? It sounds like shaking to me. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's kind of, but it just means that the prayer has a tune, a melody, and we know it was to be accompanied by stringed instruments. Maybe it means an orchestra, but since I have a worship leader husband who plays guitar and sings to the Lord every single day of his life, I think guitars were involved somehow. <laughs> you may not have thought of. Habakkuk as the Chris Tomlin or Phil Wickham of his day, but maybe he was. Chris Tomlin was not the first to write a worship song about the greatness of God. In fact, I think he was inspired by this passage. And this prayer song was written for corporate worship. God's people are meant to sing this and pray it together. On your outline is a quote from Nancy Guthrie. I just love everything Nancy Guthrie says. Habakkuk's song is a demonstration of what it looks like to live by faith. It's a celebration of just judgment, an admission of real fear, a determination to have rugged joy and an expectation of ultimate security, and we're invited to sing along. The, the last part of that we will see next week when Chris teaches. So verse two, Habakkuk says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk had begun the conversation with the Lord asking, how long till you do something about the wickedness of your people? And his attitude wasn't arrogant, but it also wasn't the posture of humility and awe and wonder that we see here. Two things he acknowledges here. I have heard the reports of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In other words, he says, Lord, you're the one I need to hear from and you're the one I need to fear. Other translations say, I stand in awe of your deeds. But literally it means I'm afraid. Gran Granny Jo, she doesn't know I'm going to say this, but <clears throat> she, we were emailing yesterday and she said, I think of Habakkuk's awe the same as the shepherds before the angel choir. And then she said, what's Hebrew for scared spitless? <laughs> yeah, that's how, they, that's how he felt. <clears throat> what the Lord was going to do was pretty terrifying. And if we look quickly at 316 at the end, we see Habakkuk's body felt fear, felt he, and it felt all of that fear. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Have you known that kind of fear? The kind that makes your entire body tremble? There are a thousand things right now that can discourage us, even more that make us afraid. Habakkuk knew what the future would be and it scared him. And I think sometimes we don't know what the future will be and that scares us. But I love that God gives us a picture of humanness in Habakkuk. Are you afraid right now? I think Habakkuk 3 teaches us how to live by faith even as our body might tremble with fear. He begins by making two requests. This is what he prays. He prays for revival and he prays for revelation. In the midst of the years, and this could mean in the midst of the years of Judah's judgment, or it could mean um, the time between Judah's judgment and the Chaldeans' judgment, that waiting time. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make your work known, Lord. Would you show us more of yourself and of your power? While all these terrible things are going on, his concern is the work of God, that it would be revived. And I, I ask myself, is that my greatest concern, that God's work will be revived? He also prays for remembrance. In wrath, remember mercy. Mercy means treat us not as our sins deserve. Habakkuk was thinking of coming judgment, and he knew that the judgment was right. It was just. Alistair Begg said, and I think I have this on, on your outline too, 
This is a prayer that will only finally and truly be answered some 700 years later outside Jerusalem as Jesus is hanging on the cross declaring it is finished. The work of redemption is whereby he took upon himself all of God's righteous wrath against sin and he displayed in himself all of God's mercy provided for the sin. Wow, to read that a few times for it to sink in. In the in my Bible, in the margin of Habakkuk, I have notes written from a summer in the sun class that we went through. I don't know, it must have been years ago. We did a minor prophets, which is a great idea for a summer in the sun class. It was one of my favorites. But next to the line, Lord, in your wrath, remember mercy, I wrote the word please with several exclamation points. Um, and it feels like such an appropriate prayer right now for our country, for our world, Lord mercy. So let's look at verses 3 to 15. If you read them and were confused, how many of you read them and were confused? Oh, nobody. <laughs> well, I was. In our study this week, we learned that Habakkuk writes in poetic form, and this is probably the most poetic part of the whole book. Um, and poetry, some, it veils the meaning as a Bible teacher, I've never taught a passage so veiled in poetic imagery. Um, I haven't had a weird nightmare um, in this last week about it. Um, in my dream, it was Wednesday, and the worship team led beautiful worship, and then the teacher was supposed to go up and teach. And I looked around and no one was going up. And Chris and I had just prayed together, and I asked her, Chris, who's teaching? And she said, Kathy, you are. And, and I, my body was trembling like Habakkuk's, and I'm like, me? Oh, no, I can't teach this. Um, just thinking, you don't know what us teachers go through before we get up here to bring the word. Oh, But as a WOW teacher, I'm also learning to keep the main thing the main thing, and that the main thing is the plain thing. And sometimes I just need to be reminded of that made it not so scary. So in verses 3 to 15, Habakkuk sings the greatness of God's power, especially his power to save, his power to deliver his people. Habakkuk recognized that what God had done in the past served as the most reliable evidence of what he would do in the future. I'm going to say that again. Habakkuk recognized that what he had done in the past served as the most reliable evidence of what he would do in the future. So Habakkuk ponders the greatness of God. We see him pondering the greatness of God's mighty acts. These verses provide a magnificent and frightening picture of God's acts in history when God came out to deliver his people. I cannot explain every imagery in line, but I want you to remember something you've heard before. Habakkuk began in gloom, but ends in glory. And we won't get to the end today, but we're learning how that transition happened right here. Let's read. Verse 3, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. God and I'm just going to stop there. God condescended to come. I mean, just, just the first two words, God came, is amazing. What a mighty act. What a condescending act to come. And then, of course, it says Selah, which means just stop and think about that. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. Stop there. What comes to mind is that song. The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. We see his majestic magnificence, the power of God. Teman and Mount Paran is a reference to God leading his people out of slavery in Egypt through the Sinai, Pen Sinai Peninsula, through the desert, safely to the promised land. 
Most of the imagery here comes from the book of Exodus. Verses 3 and 4 speak of the appearing of God's glory on Mount Sinai. Scholars call this a theophany, a, a God appearing. His splendor covered the heavens, brightness like light rays flashed from his hands. It's the scene in Exodus 19 where Mount Sinai quakes and lightning and loud peals of thunder echo forth from the mountain. Plagues and pestilence, what does that make you think of? Plagues, Egypt, Egypt right? The, the plagues in Egypt and pestilence, what does that make you think of? 2020, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Make no mistake, God is in charge during a pandemic, just as he was in charge of the plagues in Egypt when Pharaoh wouldn't let his people go. Verses 3 to 11, and I didn't say this earlier, is, is God's dominion over nature. Let's look at verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Now this is describing God who is a spirit as a man, it's personifying God, um, but it's giving him human qualities. And he stood and looked, and that was all it took to shake the world. Then the everlasting mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of cushion and affliction, the curtains of, his land, of the land of Midian did tremble. Kevin DeYoung said something to this effect because I changed a few words to make it a little more clear. Um, these problems, these people, these massive mountains of men and of nations, God towers over them as a thundering giant, flicks them over, tosses them like so much beach sand. Oh, their eternal mountains were scattered, their everlasting hills sank low. You wanna know whose ways were truly everlasting? The Lord's. I love that. Verse 8. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers? Or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? Think of the Jordan River that they crossed, the Red Sea that was crossed. You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. We're supposed to stop and think about that for a minute. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Now they are acting like people writhing. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. I want you to have that picture, that the waters lifted their hands on high. What does that make you think of? The Red Sea. The Red sea. The sun and moon stood still in their place. What does that make you think of? Joshua, right. There was a battle um, and Joshua prayed that the Lord would just have the sun and moon stand still so they could win the battle, and he did. At the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear, it was God doing the work. Verse 12, God has dominion over nations now. You march through the earth in fury. You thresh the nations in anger. And I, I don't know, this occurs to me, how you know, Habakkuk was thinking also about the Babylonians who were going to march through Judah and conquer them. And now he says, you God, you marched through the earth in fury. You thresh the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. And this, ladies, verse 13, is the overarching theme of the Bible, redemption. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Selah, stop and think. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors. So he destroyed, they're destroyed by their own weapons who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. What does that make you think of? Egypt again, yeah, the Red Sea. I'm gonna go ahead and read verse 16 
because I think it is a good bookend to verse one. He says, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters my bones, my legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. There's a sense of awe there. I have this James Montgomery Boyce quote on your outline. Faced with fear, Habakkuk reminds himself of what he knows. He knows that he worships a mighty God and he remembers the powerful acts of God. Do I not have it there? Sorry, I meant to. So just listen. Faced with fear, Habakkuk reminds himself of what he knows. He knows that he worships a mighty God and he remembers the powerful acts of God in past days. Remembering him restores his joy and brings him victory over fear of the future. We worship a mighty God. And I was thinking as I was, as I was studying, actually this morning um, I was thinking about this. Um, I've read the one-year Bible for a lot of years. And um, one time in a crisis, I was right at the place in Exodus 14 of the Red Sea. And I'm, I'm just going to... Um, Exodus 14 is um, where the people have been in Egypt for 400 years and God is bringing them out, out of slavery, out of bondage. And um, they are to the Red Sea. They have the Red Sea ahead of them and they have the Egyptian army behind them. And you can turn there, Exodus 14, because I feel like we need to read about the mightiest work of God in the Old Testament. Let's start in verse 13. So Exodus 14, 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. So in those, in my crisis, in those verses, I felt like, Okay, stand firm. When you're in a crisis, your world stops. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's true for me. I feel like my world stops. And, um, but I kept reading because this was my reading for the day. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. And I thought, oh, no, my world doesn't stop. God will bring me through just like he brought them through. Let's just keep reading. Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And it will harden, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And then bump down to 21. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them. What does this look like? They're raising their hands. It's a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. That's what he's talking about. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from, the, from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled into it. The Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. Let's go down to 30. 
Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And then what do they do? They sing. But those, those verses, that passage at that time, just reading through the Bible on a daily basis was what took me through the crisis that was not immediate. It, it lasted a while, but <clears throat> verse 13, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. What is this poem about? In each of the scenes, God is coming out to deliver his people to save his anointed ones. These are not just Bible stories. This is true. This is my history, your history. And I'm so thankful. I, I need it so desperately. I need to know what God has done. We need, we need to talk about his mighty acts. How many of you were with us when we studied seeing Jesus in every story? Do you remember that? It was a few years ago, and we just kind of hopped through Old Testament, and we just saw places that, um, where we could see the thread of redemption, really. Um, that, was, that was so good. Well, when I started studying this passage, I didn't really get it. I thought it was about Habakkuk writing a great worship song and recounting what God had done in the past so he would be encouraged in the future. And that's probably part of it, but it's so much more. Alistair Begg says, all of these things and God's deliverance of his people are foreshadowings of his ultimate deliverance in Jesus. Because it is in Jesus and in the cross that in terms of verse 2, he remembers mercy in wrath. That through this li his life and death and resurrection, the believer is safely brought through death to life. In Matthew 1, 21, it says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the answer to Habakkuk's question, how long, is really who. That's his answer. Jesus is our savior. He is the thundering giant flicking mountains like sand and bringing judgment to the nations. Of him we stand in awe. And I am so glad Pastor Chris is teaching the book of Hebrews because um, it's like I've never heard him teach that. And I wanted, it's like I really want to go through Hebrews. And um, so I'm really thankful of that. We will see Jesus is better. We'll see he's supreme. Um, Colossians 2 is such a good book about Jesus. And so is Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. On the back of your outline, Nancy Guthrie said some important things that I want to pass on to you. And I wanted to actually put it before you because it's a lot. And I want you to be able to read it and reread it and, um, and really um, kind of absorb what it's, what it's saying. By gazing intently into the scriptures, we consider carefully how God has acted in the past, and we also savor the promises he has made regarding the future. Living by faith is thinking, feeling, and acting on those things rather than solely on what we are seeing, experiencing, or feeling in the present. This means that if we're going to live by faith, we need to invest ourselves in knowing what God has done in the past and has promised for the future. And that's investing in scripture, ladies, investing our time and our energy and our thought life. And I don't mean that our focus is primarily on what God has done in our own lives in the past. What stir up, stirs up this kind of confidence in God is our ongoing exposure to what he has done over history in relationship to his people his mighty acts. 
It is reading, hearing, and considering deeply what God has done and what he has promised in the Bible that generates this kind of faith. As we saturate ourselves in God's word, we understand more clearly what God has promised and what he has not promised, and we become increasingly willing to risk everything on God's promises being fully reliable. Faith looks at the past saving works of God in the Passover, at the Red Sea, and most significantly at the cross and resurrection, and trusts that God's saving work is not simply a thing of the past. It trusts that we are, even now, being saved from the sin that would destroy us and that we will one day be delivered safely into the presence of God. We need to know God's word. And I love that we are doing this obscure book in the Old Testament because we would probably have never turned to it and just looked at it and go, but God has taught so much to us. The Psalms speak so much of God's mighty acts. Psalm 105, 106, 145. Um, we need to remember to remember. And um, that's, we need to remember. Let's go ahead and read the last few verses of Habakkuk, starting in verse 17. What a finish. So thankful God brought us to this book of the Bible. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there will be herds, and no, there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Recounting God's mighty works, Habakkuk now has a reason to rejoice. Salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we, we make much of you, Jesus. Thank you for your word that reveals and reminds us of who you are and what you have done. May we write poems and songs and sing of you and talk about how great you are. And Lord, whatever season we are in, for every woman here today, Lord, I know you are faithful. And I know that your word will speak to us right there. Lord, I pray for the group time that you would bless just the discussion time and um, all the ladies today. In Jesus' name, amen.